fundamentally, I think focusing on technology alone as the object of analysis, as opposed to the interaction between technology, social relations or institutions, and ideology is a mistake. So to ask this question separately, what brings technological change, what shapes technological change, uh, one has to connect it with uh, the social relations within which it's embedded and the ideological framework within which it's embedded. We can think of essentially three core structuring dimensions in any human society. First are the institutions or the social relations. This can include both formal, like law, and informal, like norms. These can include things that are uh, explicit, as well as habits and practices that are implicit. And these essentially create the uh, set of relations of power and affordance among people that structure their relations. Then we can look at ideas or ideology or meaning that um, structure how we understand the world. So whether you're talking about uh, habitus, whether you're talking about ideology, whether you're talking about frame analysis across many and diverse disciplines and, and approaches, the core understanding that the way we understand the world affects what we know how we know, how we interpret what we know, how we behave and respond, how we define our goals is central. And the third major structuring dimension is this dimension of congealed practical knowledge embodied in material culture, the things with which we work in the world. These three dimensions interact with each other across the four core domains of human life economy or how we produce things, polity or how we manage violence, reproduction, kinship or how we manage reproduction, and culture and meaning, how we make meaning together in the world. And so when you ask what shapes the rate and direction of innovation or what causes technolo technology, uh, it always has to be understood within the context of a particular set of institutions a particular cultural meaning, um, and it may have different or somewhat different effects within these four basic uh, domains of, of, of life. If you look at the telecommunications system that emerges in the early 20th century, whether it's privately owned as in the United States or publicly owned as it is everywhere else, similarly, you have a highly centralized model that also results in a technical infrastructure that is highly centralized, with the switches and controlled very centrally, with the phones having a very narrow range of capabilities. And the technology both implements the ideology and the social relations of structures of control, and helps inform them so that by looking at the way the material world we built operates, allows us to understand uh, who we are and how we are. What we see essentially in the 70s, and from the 70s really until the Great Recession um, uh, in 2008, is a dramatic break from the first two thirds of the 20th century that again reflects itself in ideology, in social relations, and in technology, which feed into each other both to shape our imagination about how we can organize our relations and to implement in material culture the social relations we imagine for ourselves. To understand technology as the driving force would be a mistake. To imagine that technology is epiphenomenal and wasn't actually centrally a, a part of the story of changing how much labor was absorbed into the household how much uh, freedom there was from the family uh, would also be a mistake. So you really need the continuous understanding across all three of these dimensions of technology, social relations, and ideology, and across all four domains of action, economy, polity, kinship, and culture, to get a decent grasp of what's going on and where it's going.
So one of the critical things we've learned over the last 25 years is that the rate of innovation, but also the direction of innovation, are influenced by shifting from a property-based model to a commons-based model uh, in a way that uh, needs to completely redefine how we understand the relationship between the state, the market, and innovation. And that, in fact, social uh, uh, innovation around the commons becomes a central uh, driver of innovation. One of the interesting things of the change in uh, particularly the social science literature of the last quarter century has been a recognition of the importance of the interaction between non-market and market actors, between not only the state and market actors, but also uh, networks of uh, socially motivated individuals. So if you imagine a universe in which in the uh, mid 20th century, uh, you see large centralized organizations being the primary driver of innovation. Think Schumpeter and the idea of creative destruction and the major organizations that compete, create a new market, and then control it. The classic model there, that's Bell Labs, which has more Nobel laureates in physics than any university department in the mid-century. Um, uh, that's major investment and the creation of federal funding of science in the United States. That's the mid-century model. The large organization, both state and market, are the primary drivers. Um, then you have the uh, emergence over the course of the 70s and 80s of the idea that it's really about entrepreneurial firms. And it's constantly this idea of smaller entrepreneurial firms driven by market competition with ever more perfect property rights. Uh, and that's what drives the extreme growth in patents and the centrality of intellectual property rights to, world trade, uh, to the World Trade Organization and the TRIPS agreement and later on the bilateral agreements. It's a shift from the idea of very small number of firms that exercise control by market power and don't need so much patents and government funding to these entrepreneurial competitive firms. One of the things that's really developed in the last 25 years has been an understanding that loose networks of individuals and social relations, academia and nonprofits, civil society organizations and activists interact with small firms and large firms that even the large firms themselves are highly diverse in the extent to which they're controlling as opposed to allowing for a flow of information. The critical shift to understand is that there is no single optimal organization or solution that is the primary driver. It's not only government funding, though it is that too. It's not only uh, uh, big companies, although it's that too. It's not only entrepreneurial firms, although it's that too. And even though I've spent so much of my time working on commons-based peer production and distributed innovation in the network, it would be a mistake to imagine that all innovation comes from there too. The critical thing is the interaction between these and knowledge flows and innovation at the end, the individual users, uh, uh, the uh, hacker uh, cultures, that's what's driving innovation, the interaction between these more than anything else. One of the most um, surprising, possibly the most surprising um, uh, fact of the development of the internet uh, in its first uh, 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 15 years or so was the absolutely central role of commons-based production for the creation of the internet. So if you asked a room full of practicing economists in 1995 that here are two groups of uh, uh, engineers. One is the biggest software company in the world seeing that their major strategic uh, next step is to move to the web. 
and the other is a collection, an informal collection of engineers who've adopted a model that lets anybody copy the software that they produced and exercises no exclusive rights. Which of these two will become the core infrastructure of the World Wide Web? And you would have said it was the commons-based engineers. You would have been laughed out of the room. And yet, the Apache Web Server, uh, Linux, MySQL, email, the LAMP stack as a whole, scripting languages, statistics with R, a whole class of basic infrastructure was developed on a model that was considered theoretically inadmissible when in practice it worked. The same is true obviously for Wikipedia, um, uh, but even the Internet Engineering Task Force itself is a completely anarchic collection of, volunteer, of voluntary participants with no structures for uh, formal decision making other than argument, humming, and implementation. So there's a fundamental uh, um, uh, drive that drove the internet uh, in the direction that it went, which was uh, highly resilient, continuously learning, not optimized for anything, including not for prices, that emerged out of a way of organizing innovation that was practically inadmissible in the 1990s. The second thing that um, uh, comes out of that recognition uh, in terms of the rate of innovation is the absolute centrality of homo socialis relative to homo economicus. That is to say the fact that we have about a quarter century of work from evolutionary biology through experimental economics to political science and sociology that documents experimentally and theoretically that the model of the self-interested rational actor acting um, uh, under self-interest with guile is simply a poor model of actual human behavior in the real world. Instead, what we have are diverse people um, responding to diverse uh, uh, um, uh, motivations, uh, and in particular affected by the particular institutional framework within which they're in. So if you build a framework that treats people as self-interested, they become more self-interested. If you treat them as one like Wikipedia, assume good faith, one that depends on trust, sometimes there will still be people who will take advantage of that trust. You cannot exist in the second decade of the 21st century without recognizing that there are the spammers and the crackers and the propagandists who will take advantage of open systems. It's not a utopia. But at the same time, some small majority of people nonetheless act as trusting human beings and cooperative human beings as part of this model of innovation, but also of, of economic organization. So as you're trying to understand both the rate and direction of innovation, understanding that our experience and the social sciences have moved us from thinking about self-interested individuals to socially motivated individuals with diverse motivations. I think that there are highly visible daily changes. The fact that 10 years ago there was no smartphone and now we can't imagine life without and you have Uber uh, that completely depends and wouldn't exist without it and that there are whole so makes us feel as though the rate of change has dramatically uh, increased and our dependence on machines has increased. But I think it, that's actually very hard to establish empirically. And I think the fundamental, fundamental change is already uh, at the beginning of industrialization and at, at, at the latest by the second quarter of the 19th century where we see no generation really living with the same technology of the generation that preceded it, and where the structures of economic production, political participation, and even family structure are continuously disrupted by a new class of technological innovations.
Um, I would say, yes, we are deeply dependent on the interactions between our institutions and our technology, but I haven't seen the evidence that the rate of change is increasing. Technology is not destiny. There is no determinant consequence of any particular technological change. What there is, is a continuous political, social, ideological struggle over how technology develops, how it's implemented, what sort of social relations it uh, underscores and naturalizes, and what we are seeing, as we have seen for, gener for several generations now, is significant variation between different countries at the same technological frontier. One thing that all, I would say, democratic countries today face is a fundamental crisis of democratic theory and a fundamental crisis of a sense of identity and what it is to be together with each other. There is a class of claims about this crisis that located in technology and the changes of skills bias technical change, automation, creating insecurity about long-term um, um, unemployment, uh, the idea that the app economy will generalize precarity and precarious existence, and that technology is disrupting this, these institutions. There is an equally powerful opposite techno-utopianism that imagines that technology will eliminate scarcity, that technology will allow for more efficient government to know everything that's going on, that we will be able through the use of behavioral uh, marketing in updating uh, apps to nudge people in the direction of living a better life. All of these are possible and none of them are determinate. We could see a dystopia of the worst kind where essentially a very small class of capital owners extract all of the value, manipulate populations through propaganda that is instantiated and personalized through network propaganda, measure and identify individually what will mobilize an individual to want this or that, to buy this or that, to vote this or that, and then create a surveillance-based system that individually manipulates every individual. We could also, in principle, see a utopia in which, through the use of very personalized and uh, AI-driven uh, adaptations, gives people the ability to optimize their own lives, to connect better with other people, to monitor their governments and hold it to accountability better, to participate and self-organize in democratic politics, Technology allows either one of these edges of utopia and dystopia, and there won't be one answer. Which of these will ultimately win in which countries, and how, or what mix of them will win, will largely determine the way in which, over the next 50 years, we will adopt the new technologies, whether in the end we'll end up with something that we still recognize as democracy or not, whether in the end we still end up with something that we would, could call autonomy, or whether we will become automatons controlled either by a benevolent state or by uh, uh, marketing companies uh, remains to be seen. I think the most important currently observable agglomeration of technologies that has uh, at a bare minimum, the highest risk to the possibility of more or less autonomous in, uh, individuals in a more or less democratic society uh, is the cluster that allows both companies and governments to measure us at a very individual level, the ubiquity of sensors, to uh, observe our responses to different interventions so as to experiment on a population scale, to process that data into a highly refined individualized models, which is to say what we think of as big data or more recently machine learning and AI, 
that together create the possibility of a small number of actors, whether state or market, that can, through experimental validation, recognize and manipulate what we know about the world, our beliefs, what we want, our preferences, and what are the actions that are available to us and the outcomes available to us. That, to me, is the greatest threat. We've seen three fundamental changes over the last 25 years in core theoretical understandings that are relevant to technological change and its relation to social structure. The first is a shift in the nature of rationality from the idea of self-interested rational actors whose rationality is prior to the context in which they interact to a model of reasonable and embedded individuals who are not optimizers, but are rather satisficers, and whose motivations and view of rationality is embedded within the interaction. We've seen a shift in the model from self-interested rational actors to um, socially motivated individuals with diverse motivations. We've seen a shift from a uniform focus on property and contract to the interaction between property and commons. And uh, we've seen a shift from the idea of motivations being completely disconnected from context to understanding that motivations are dependent. So if you treat people as self-interested actors, they become more, they behave more in a self-interested way and they treat each other uh, as, as strangers. If you treat them more as connected, they cooperate more. Moving from the abstract to the particular, there are fields of work where we've seen technology being um, regulated in ways that reflect one or another of these frameworks, and there are very particular institutional uh, implementations. So you look at spectrum policy, you move from the idea of fully regulated spectrum to markets in spectrum, and now to spectrum commons. And as an empirical matter, most of the innovation at the edges if you're talking today about Internet of Things, if you're talking today about uh, high, high, high capacity data at a very local level, none of that can happen over proprietary spectrum. It's all been driven by spectrum commons. If you're looking at software, the whole path of going to software patents was a fundamental error that we today understand. They've become more about rent extraction than about innovation. And rather what we've seen is free and open source software a commons-based model being adopted by a larger number of firms and providing some of the very basic infrastructure. So these are very concrete things. You can look at the shift from individual invention to knowledge flows that has been absolutely central and has exactly the same stru analytic structure, absolutely central to understanding regional development. And the shift from the idea that I need strong patents or strong uh, that I need strong patents or that I need strong trade secrets to the idea that what you want is to assure circulation and flow of people. And it's more about people bringing people and allowing them to have conversations in regions that has allowed regions to, to e emerge. I would say that the critical underlying mechanism is uh, ideology or the shared conception within a society of how things fit together, what works with what, what's reasonable or plausible to, interact, uh, to, to do in interaction with each other, what things mean, what to prefer. So there's a fundamental uh, driver, which is a, an aspect of culture, uh, 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 a zeitgeist of a certain kind that allows people 
to uh, uh, not only allows, forces people to understand the possibilities and what to do with something in a way that is um, uh, enormously constraining and uh, um, in terms of how they use things. And when you're looking from period to period over the last hundred and so years about how technology was deployed, how it was implemented, which technologies were emphasized and which were abandoned, repeatedly what you see is that there is, at a bare minimum, an elite shared sense. And by elite, I mean the small set within society that controls outsized power over organizational and institutional frameworks that sees the world in a certain way and then interprets what it sees to fit that mental model and implements the system. So Taylorism and Fordism and managerialism was a certain way of looking at the world. And then you saw technologies and institutions fitting it. Then suddenly privatization and, and, and deregulation became a way to look at administrative ways. And then suddenly, if you're looking at environmental regulation, then you have tradable permits. If you're looking at spectrum, pro at spectrum you have uh, auctions uh, and, uh, and so forth. So you see a change, a fundamental change. Or in the US in particular, to a, some extent in the UK as well, you see a shift from the idea of managers as stewards of stakeholders to the idea of superstars. And with that, you see a fundamental re uh, reorientation of how technologies get implemented in organizations to allow a stable, financialized, uh, small uh, elite to create a much more precarious uh, 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 work, much more precarious work uh, for workers. So that's one major driving force. The institutions of a society, the basic rules by which people see themselves as bound to each other, similarly are constraining to how far things can go and how they get shaped. The primary threat of failing to steer comes from the hope or belief of finding an optimal intervention point. So we absolutely need increased state capacity to counter the increased power of uh, uh, firms, particularly multinationals, that are now shaping the uh, technological and social infrastructure around their capabilities. So the place that we see it most directly is in, uh, we think of it as privacy, but really fundamentally, it's about forcing companies to maintain a narrower range of information collection and use practices than they want to or can, because one of the fundamental challenges to the possibility of democratic and liberal society and market society is the fact that we have become programmable. Enough data is collected about us individually, and enough of our interaction with the world is now manipulable in real time and individualized, that behavioral psychology and economics now makes it possible for governments and companies to measure us, experiment on us, and nudge us in the directions of developing preferences and um, uh, practices that fit their project, not ours. So we need a fundamental concerted effort to harness politics to prevent that emergence. The state itself is a complex agglomeration of bureaucratic and politically accountable and judicial structures, so you need uh, nation-specific strategic plan for intervention to contain the state's use of the ability to surveil and manipulate its population, while at the same time harnessing its unique power over violence to contain the companies that are doing the same thing. Both of which also need to see the fact that in the social distributed model, there's enough abuse and enough of a mob 
uh, possibility or, or risk of a mob uh, 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 structure of various forms, left, right, you name it, that that also needs to be controlled. And we're seeing it now when we're looking at um, uh, fake news and abuse online. We're seeing it now when we're looking at so-called sharing economy or platform economy uh, in cities. You're seeing this effort to mix and match between these very fallible but necessary components, market, state-based organizations, and social uh, uh, distributed network uh, 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 practices uh, as a continuous effort to diagnose where there's a risk, diagnose who's the best ally today, and then act morally and politically to get there. The fact that we continue to have highly decentralized capabilities in our hand to form networks, to communicate with each other, to self-organize, offers a real alternative for, to a more participatory a more, a, a economy and a more participatory society. Uh, as long as you have these negative features of centralized manipula manipulation contained. So to me, that's one class. Both of these technologies, highly distributed computation, highly distributed sensors, with uh, a high degree of capability of processing data at a very high level can implement both a fundamental undermining of both markets. If you can manipulate preferences, then markets have no meaning because markets simply satisfy preferences. And democracy has no meaning because democracy clears people's political preferences. Both democracy and markets cannot survive when preferences are themselves the object of manipulation. That needs to be stopped. But the same technologies can also produce a, a very distributed and highly participatory model. So that's one class of interventions. The second, obviously, at a planetary level, is the question of, of uh, distributed energy generation from natural uh, uh, and renewable resources. Uh, that's a fundamental question of how we get reorganized. And in principle, you could certainly see radically decentralized uh, energy uh, production, uh, changing the extent to which we can have decentralized collaborative uh, production as opposed to centralized. Uh, and similarly, though we've been saying it for a while, uh, the question of distributed fabrication, uh, what we would today think of as fab labs or 3D printing, the extent to which you can actually live in a world in which most of the daily necessities can be fabricated at least in, at a local level, uh, uh, possibly at an individual level, could again radically transform um, uh, production and consumption. Those, those are deeply um, uh, disruptive, but very near-term plausible frameworks, both in a, in a positive and in a negative way.